morning. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing? I have an idea I want to run by you when, um, when everyone's in here. But let's wait for a lot more people to get in first before we do it. Good morning, good morning. Oops. This is very full. Oh, dear. funny about the no face detected thing some people don't even have their faces on their lives so like why do they care if no face is detected like what's the issue i don't get it hey renee you made it up in the air like you know what i'm saying like why does it matter like some people show video games that they're playing some people show like whatever like i don't know you do you like i don't know Anyway, that's, that's my thought for the moment. How was everyone's Monday? We, uh, yes, TikTok can register that. <laughs> You're funny. You're funny, Anya. You are a silly lady. Um, so to those of you who can't, um, well, you, okay, so yesterday we went to... The Monday was Monday, yeah. We went to see Iron Maiden last night. Well, that's certainly something, huh? That's a big one. Um, so yesterday we went to the pumpkin patch with uh, my sister and my mom and my niece and my nephew, which is great. I brought some slime to my niece because she had killed her old slime, which is fine. That's what happens, like in a good way. She's very good with it. And she needed a new one, so I brought her some new slimes. And I also brought my pregnant belly. Those were the things that she noticed, right? And then, when she got home, she had her mom film her making a slime video. This is true. Where she said, and I quote, Hi everybody, we're gonna play with slime today. I almost died. I almost died on the spot, passed away, and me. My four-year-old niece is making videos of herself with slime. And my husband goes, oh, she's being you. And I was like, yes. How do you have more than 10 friends? <laughs> That's very funny. Then the next video I get from my sister is my niece with a baby doll stuffed in her shirt. And she said, mommy, look, I'm having a baby. And my sister said, oh yeah, what's her name? And my niece is naming her child Harper, which I think is great actually, because when I was her age, I don't think I was clever enough to come up with a name as good as Harper. And I was like, you know what, Zoe? Name your child Harper. I support you. That's a great name. The problem is when my sister asked for further information about the baby. Baby Harper is, I mean, it's a great name, Renee. I'm fully in support of it. Um, this baby that is in my four-year-old niece's belly, supposedly, is her brother's cousin. And my sister replied to her and said, well, I guess it's good to know we're Targaryens then, huh? <laughs> It's like, what is happening over there? Oh, Amanda, I have to tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to. Uh, Mina, Mina, Mina. Um, Mina, when you are here and focused, I have to tell you something um, that you're going to love. <laughs> oh, yes, Gigi. Oh, yes. Um, when Mina can hear me, I have to repeat part of this because she's going to scream. Um, okay, Mina. 
I brought Zoe new slime yesterday and the result of bringing Zoe new slime was that my sister sent me a video that Zoe asked her to film where Zoe is playing with her slime on camera and she says, hi everybody, we're gonna play with slime today and then plays with the slime on camera. I screamed, I screamed when I saw it. Mina, you would die. Um, it's everything. I was like in tears laughing. It's like, she's four and she watches my slime. She's like, we don't put her online. Like her face is never online, obviously. But like, she watches my slime videos, of course, because that's Aunt Sasha and that's what we do, you know, whatever. And all of you know that she has been the voiceover in some of my slime videos because she's smart and she knows how to do it, you know? Oh my gosh, just cracked me up. Hi everybody, we're gonna play with slime today. <laughs> I was like, are we? Okay. It's so funny. And then there's a second video of her like pressing into the slime and she goes, ugh, ugh, ugh. And she's going like this with the slime, like pressing into it like this. And my sister says, what are you doing? And she said, I'm trying to make the slime good. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Thank you for trying to make the slime good. I really appreciate it. Oh God, if ever there was a video that I wish I could post of her, it's that one because that is just, gotta make it good. I mean, what good is it if it's no good? Nobody wants it if it's no good. Um, it's very funny to me. <laughs> it's very funny. You know what I actually should do? Oh, for sure, Becca, for sure. It's the funniest picture. You guys, we have a picture of Ellie and Zoe at Disneyland and they they were so cute together, but they could not be more different. It's so funny. But what I should do with the video of Zoe playing with slime is I should take the voiceover from it and I should lip sync to it and I should do like the motions like, and in the background you just hear her voice going hey everybody it's time to play with slime but it's me on the camera so that you guys can hear how funny it is oh my gosh maybe i'll do that today it's so funny i'm trying to make it good <laughs> okay i'll do that later it's very her little voice is too cute i mean it's everything um you know we just don't show her face obviously for safety it's too cute i mean it's everything um you know, we just don't show her face, obviously, for safety reasons. Um, obviously, for safety reasons. Um, Kids are too funny, you guys. Kids are too, too funny. They literally are the best. Cracks me up. But yes, um, we have we have many pictures actually of Zoe and Ellie together at Disneyland and here at my house at the pool. They had a sweet time playing with little Disney toys and everything. I do have an espresso, Danny. I we live for it. I don't think we could live without it in our home, if I'm being honest, Danny. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is maybe the most used item in our home. I don't know what that says about us. Um, Danny, last time, so we're with my Bessie daughter, it was funny though. You know what I gotta tell you, Danny? And it, it's, <laughs> this is what I'm gonna tell you. Last time we went to the Nespresso store to buy pods, they had started a new thing, which was that you could have monthly orders delivered to you and get a discount. And you know me, I'm a cheap butt, so I need a discount, right? And so I was like, oh, well, can I sign up for that here in person? And they were like, yeah. They were like, you just tell us what you want, you know, to be delivered to you every month. And I had just 
placed my order of what I was gonna take home that day, which was, you know, a significant amount of pods. And I said, well, just all that stuff I just ordered. And the guy goes, oh, oh, so y'all be drinking a lot of coffee in your house. And I was like, what? And he was like, you're gonna get all of these every month? I was like, well, there's two of us. He was like, two of you. I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, I love the monthly ordering, but I did get shamed by the Nespresso guy for our consumption. I do consume less coffee since being pregnant, but we still go through a lot because I have been using some of the decaf pods to extend how much of it I can drink. Yeah, Judgy McJudgerson. So what I do in the morning sometimes, y'all, is I will use a half caffeinated pod in the morning so I can have a second cup in the afternoon. He did say slow it down, coffee girl. We do too, Danny. And like Secret Husband drinks even more of it than I do, especially now that I'm pregnant. And so like we go through a lot. You know, we work a lot, you guys. He sh That's what I'm saying, Sloth. I was like, bro, you just got a baller sign up on your record. Like, why are you being Judgy McJudgersons? You just look like you signed someone up for like 30 million pods a month. Yeah, when the baby comes, we're gonna be drinking even more, it's for sure. Um, but like, Judgy Van Holier than thou, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I was like, you work at a coffee store, sir. I need you to take several seats and stop judging my consumption. First of all, I don't eat sugar. I barely, I mean, like I don't drink now that I'm pregnant, obviously, but even before I was pregnant, I hardly drink. I've never even put a cigarette in my mouth, let alone smoked anything. You leave my coffee alone, sir. Sir. The baby starts drinking coffee. Actually, we have a whole thing that we make for the kids in our family <clears throat> so it looks like they're um, drinking coffee with us. So like I would have Zoe make coffee with me and we would, um... oh yeah, that's true. That's true, Becca. Um... Oh, well, sure, of course, Liz, that's different. But um, we would like get different kinds of milks and all my superfood powders and we would make her her own coffee, you know, whatever. It's, it's milk and like cream, you know, whatever. But we would make her coffee. Um, it is very cute. I have the hiccups. I do. Um, I forgot to redecorate my Kindle this weekend. I was supposed to do that and I forgot, but maybe I'll get around to it today. Mailing a bunch of orders today, y'all. Oh, and by the by, don't go right now because we're about to start reading, but when this is over, if you're on Patreon, I did put up a poll this morning, questions about advent calendars, um, just an FYI. So, yeah. That is the sitch. There we go. There we go. Candy cigarettes all the way. Did you ever get the candy cigars? No, are they good? I emailed you about my exploding slime. Yes, you did. I saw it. I haven't opened it yet because I knew I couldn't mail anything. I always try with those things to leave them unopened until I can address it and the post office wasn't open yesterday, so I'll mail it today, Sophie. Um, and it'll like go with all the, I'll, I'll have it with all the other stuff. I did that before book club. Oh, hey, I wanted to ask you all a question and like kind of, you started a Krampus retelling. Oh, interesting. I put my two cents in the poll before. Great, thank you, Gigi. Um, so I have a question for you all. I just wanted to get like the temperature of how you all felt about this. What if we had a kind of book exchange, like a secret Santa book exchange for book club for Christmas. Now hear me out, I don't want anyone to have to spend money other than just to ship the book. So I was thinking it would be a book you have in your home that you think the other person would like and we would all like exchange books. If you don't have a book in your home you're willing to let go of, you could go to like a used bookstore or something and get one really cheap. But I thought it would be kind of cute if we just like had like a circle where everyone was just like sending a book to the other person that you hope that they haven't read. Okay, well, not Becca, but like we can send Becca a kid's book. It's fine. Her kids read. Um, but it would be kind of fun, right? I don't know. It seems kind of sweet. And like a lot of us have books lying around that either we would love to recommend to someone or whatever, whatever. Um, or maybe ones that weren't your cup of tea, but you know someone else in the group would like based on their interests. You know what I mean? Um, so that could be kind of interesting. Um, you know, it, it was just a thought. Maybe an audiobook for Becca. We, so that could be kind of interesting. Um, you know, it, it was just a thought. Maybe audiobook for Becca. It, we can ask.
So that's just something I was throwing out there. I don't want this to be like anything where people have to spend money other than, of course, like I said, but the, the shipping, but just so everyone knows when you're sending books, um, unless you hate them, then send them the one hated. Yes, of course. Well, but here's the thing. There are some books that I don't like that people in the group like, you know what I mean? And that's the truth. Like I'm not a fourth wing fan. So, um, it is hard to know what people have read already. So it would, it would be a crapshoot a little bit, Renee. You're right about that. Yeah. Media mail. So media mail is considerably cheaper and it works anytime you are sending books or magazines or anything like that. So definitely use that and it will cost you just a couple of bucks to mail the book. Um, Renee is right. We won't know what people have already read. So you're kind of doing a shot in the dark here, but it's, it, it's still sweet and cute. I don't know. Uh, you don't have, you don't like fourth wing and you like oatmeal raisin. We all have our flaws. It's true. We do all have our flaws. I don't like fourth wing and I do like oatmeal raisin. It's true. It is like blind date with a book. It's exactly like that except with friends basically. Yeah. Um, so it's just a thought that I'm throwing around. Yeah. I'd be willing to take the chance and look, here's the thing. If you get a book you've already read, it's a used book anyway, just donate it to a little library and someone else will get the joy out of it. You know what I mean? So like, it's still good. Um, it is even November and I might turn on the heat. You know, it's a little chilly here today too. It's true. I'm not turning on any heat, but yeah, I do think it would be kind of fun. Um, I'll probably try to like make a sign up form or something for that. And then, um, people can sign up and like put their genres in it. And then each person will be assigned to somebody. Um, yada, yada, yada. I remember that Liz. Um, so anyway, that was just an idea I was throwing out there. It's kind of cute and fun. Um, and then we could like maybe open them all on a zoom or something. I don't know. Uh, or, or everybody can make a video opening them. That's actually might be even cuter. Just like, so that it doesn't mean that everyone has to be available at the same time. Um, we can all make videos opening our, our individual ones and you find out who, I don't know, whatever. Some people don't make videos, so we'll, we'll figure something out. Anyway, that's all. I just thought it was sweet. It's cutesy, very cutesy, very demure. Okay. So we are on chapter 17 y'all. We are definitely going to be done with this book. Um, actually we might read two chapters today because this chapter is only 18 minutes long and I read faster than the predicted time. So, um, um, Julia, let's check out if media mail still works for Canada. It might, it just might. Um, we'll find out, Julia, we'll figure it out. <clears throat> okay. So chapter 17, Josh dreamed that he was being chased by the devil. The devil had a nasty little beard and glinting evil eyes, and he sent demons to torture Josh in the form of his ex-girlfriend. Maya was dressed in some flimsy negligee and seduced him in a field and laughed at him when he begged her to stop. The devil locked him in a cellar where ghosts tormented him with their weeping. It sounded like the desperate cries of a baby. He saw, Jesus, <clears throat> I know, seriously. He saw a woman hanging by her neck from a tree and felt the noose close around his own throat and a prickling scratching sensation that choked and choked him. Josh, Josh, wake up. You're having a bad dream. He scrambled desperately at his throat. Josh, a light flicked on and Josh gasped back to life, flickering, flinching from the brightness for just a second. Are you all right? And Josh screamed and scrambled from the bed because there was a complete stranger stroking his arm and leaning over him naked and her bare breasts were against his chest. Josh, the sheets tingled around his legs and he stumbled crashing to the floor. Hey, who the F are you? Are you all right? You get away from me. He cast around desperately for a weapon, but for some reason, when furnishing his bedroom, he had neglected to place any baseball bats, side arms, or planks with nails in them beside his bed. Outside, a sudden crackle of thunder made him scream again, and he grabbed at the nearest thing and threw it at her. She looked down, bemused at his sock. Josh, it's a thunderstorm. Are you all right? Are you actually still asleep? No, I am not asleep, and how do you even know my name? He scrambled away from her across the floor, horribly aware that he too was naked, and grabbed it close. I'm going to call the police. The naked woman in his bed drew up short at that. Okay, wait, this isn't funny, she said. What's going on? You're asking me what's going on? He looked around. This was his room in Brick Manor, Brook Manor Farm with the bare floorboards and the low windowsill and the rug that Sienna had bought for him. Holy shit, Sienna, the baby. 
Josh struggled to get his boxers on a difficult feet while backing towards the door and tried to remember what situation was with the phone line. His own phone was sitting on the bedside table, but he didn't go back for it, not with the naked stranger so close by. Maybe he should go into Sienna's room and get her phone, but he didn't want to draw attention to them. Josh, it's just me. It's it's Essie, Essie Winterscale. The name sounded so fake. Probably her English accent was fake too. Who? Thunder crashed again and the lightning flashed across through the curtains. She was a total stranger. Nothing in her frankly unremarkable features was familiar to him at all. And she held the bed close up to her now as if she was suddenly realizing that she was naked in his bed and that that might be inappropriate. How did you get in here and are you armed? No, of course I'm not armed. She looked worried now. I came in with you a few hours ago. Don't you remember we brought Sienna back with us? You stay away from Sienna, he edged toward the door. She raised her hands, or at least tried to, and the sheet began to slip. Don't you even think about it, said Josh, glaring at her, and he realized that he was trembling. You can't just seduce me like that. You think that I'll wake up with a naked woman and be so into it that I won't even care who she is? That's assault, you know. I'm calling the police. The woman appeared to be a good actress because she even managed to get some tears into her eyes. Josh, please, I don't know what kind of game this is, but you really need to stop. This is not a game, said Josh. This was the most serious he had ever felt in his life. He opened the door and his eyeballs, he eyeballed Sina's room. Her door was still shut. I'm Essie, I'm your, well, I don't know what you call it, but we've been together for a week. Don't you remember? No, said Josh, and he glanced back inside his room and nodded at a pile of fabric on the floor. He felt braver now, are those your clothes? Yes, good. Now put them on and get the F out of here. You've got five minutes to do so. Josh had never owned a firearm in his life, which is probably just as well because if he had one right now, he would probably be aiming it at her. Should he let her go and then call the police or maybe keep her here? How was he going to do that? Across the hall, Sienna was asleep with her new baby, his nephew. Sienna, who was extremely wealthy and very vulnerable, that, well, that decided it for him. Hey, you toss me my phone he said, and she did so, looking somewhat heartbroken. Josh, please. Get dressed, he snapped, catching it and trying to remember through this fog of terror what emergency service numbers were in England. Look, if you want me to go, I'll just go, she said, although she cast a doubtful glance at the curtain window where the lightning was flashing and thunder was crashing outside. If you've changed your mind about us, us, said Josh, there's no goddamn us and he glanced back at Sienna's room again, 999. That was the number. He dialed it and waited for the answer. Yes, I need the police now. There's an unknown intruder in my house. But when he looked up, she was gone. The storm was raging, even worse than on the night that they performed the winter ritual. Essie was soaked through to the skin, not least because she'd climbed out of the window in just her knickers and got hurriedly dressed once she was in the tree line. Her arms and legs were covered with scrapes and her feet were bleeding all over because she'd left her shoes behind and she'd banged her knees on the landing of the bay window beneath Josh's bedroom. But none of that quite hurt so much as the look on his face when he told her there's no goddamn us. There had to be some explanation. She told herself this as she hurried home through the woods, the dark trees whipping in the wind and lashing at her face and arms. There had to be some reason that this sweet loving man that she'd gone to bed with had woken up accusing her of being a strange and intrude her, a danger to Sienna and the baby. The way he looked at her, it was the way that Hopkins had looked at her 400 years ago. The storm was deafening and the sky was full of lightning that only served to illuminate the mass of dark clouds boiling up in the sky. And Essie realized that she should have been freezing, but she was hot. Although maybe that was just because of sheer rage and fear. They should have stayed. And what, she thought, tried to reason with him. Josh looked like he was half a second from finding a baseball bat and beating her with it. Essie had no magic that would work against that. What was she gonna do? Freeze him in place until his memory started working again? Memory. He kept forgetting the house before all of this, but he'd never forgotten her before. Hey, Grayson. Um. Just so you know, we're only about a page and a half in, but Essie and Josh woke up together and from Josh was having a bad nightmare and he forgot who Essie is and basically threatened her and called the police and called her an intruder. It was very bad, but that's basically all we've done so far. It's very sad and so she's running home right now. Even before they went through the time door, he'd known exactly who Essie was whenever they met in the village or pub. He remembered every detail of their meeting outside and his memory of the house itself had seemed to be getting stronger ever since he read that parchment. Her steps faltered, mud oozed between her toes and a branch smacked her in the back. 
the parchment. Did she still have a photo of it on her phone? Oh crap, where was her phone? It wasn't in her sodden pockets. Damn it, damn it, damn it. She must have left it behind. If she could just get Josh to read the parchment again, maybe he would remember her. Maybe she needed to gather the coven and get them to run some kind of perception spell on him so that he wouldn't keep forgetting the coven, the spell, the rain pelting against Essie's face turned to ice. Lilith had been so angry when she found out that Josh was a Hopkins. Furious that Essie was fraternizing with him, desperate to prove that he was evil, and she'd always been so protective of the perception spell on the house. Mother said Essie as the sky turned yellow and the rain froze in the air. What did you do? Snow should not have covered the ground soaked by the storm, but this snow did. The earth froze and the sky froze with it, and the snow came so thick and fast that it was impossible to move through it. Impossible for anyone but Essie, that was. She stalked through the woods, trees giving way to snowflakes sizzling on her skin. Her bare feet left melting footprints, pink with blood. The house was wreathed with snow and drips of it were obscuring the front steps and the porch. Essie strode grimly up them, threw open the door and shouted, mother. She glared at the fireplace and it burst into a pale bluish flame. On the stairs, the worried face of Marley the dog appeared. It's all right. Wait, sorry. It's all right. The storm won't hurt you, she assured him. Mother, I know you can hear me. Marley crept down the stairs with his tail between his legs. From the passage came a frightened bleat. It was one of Blessing's goats poking her nose around the corner. A private dispute between humans, said Essie to the unspoken question the goats were asking. Go back to your stable, you will be fine. Tonkin and Bob wandered around her ankles and their fur smeared against her wet jeans and steam rose from Essie's skin. Lilith Winterscale, I command you to come down here at once. The house shook with the force of her voice and Essie had never felt anger like this. From the corners of the house, Blessing, Avery, and Maud all appeared and prudence floated through the still open door. It be blowing a hooli out there, she observed as the snow swirled around her. Aye, it's freezing, said Avery. He was bearded and wore paisley pajamas. <clears throat> um, it's the middle of the night, said Blessing, her silk bonnet slipping from her braids. Is it the monster? said Maud. Essie strode toward the old woman who stood in a nightshirt, clutching the shawl around herself. In one hand, she held a candle and an old-fashioned chamber stick. That, jo that scarf that you gave Josh, she said, what was it made from? Um, Yorkshire wool, said Maud promptly, knitted on bamboo stitch in moss. It scratched his neck to nearly bleeding, Essie said, and Maud was silent for a moment. Her milky eyes gave nothing away. "'Tis not but he who is him,' she said. "'Listen, I don't have time for riddles,' said Essie. "'It's scratching, not he,' Maud said urgently. "'But him, the other one.' Essie glanced at the others for help, but they just shrugged at her. She shoved up her sodden sleeves and stormed up the stairs. "'Mother!' she shouted. "'If you have gone back through that bloody door, you coward!' "'What did you call me?' Lilith appeared in front of her painting, and Essie sometimes suspected it concealed the door to her bedroom, which she never visited, which in itself was kind of a strange thing. Essie trembled with rage. I said, you're a coward. You disappeared through the door in the past instead of ever spending time in the present, your own present, my present. Lilith stood on the landing, more beautiful than anyone had a right to be in a nightdress, her hair bound with red ribbon. Well, it might be yours, but it isn't mine, she said. I can go where I can do the most good, Essabet. You were never neglected. I haven't seen you for years. You're a grown woman. A grown woman, Essie advanced on her mother, her bleeding feet all over the carpet, who just got kicked out of her boyfriend's bed because he thought she was a stranger. Furious tears burned her eyes, and Lilith calmly said, Oh, you know there's a perception spell on this house? Don't give me that. He knew perfectly well outside the house. You were there. You saw us. Lilith was silent for a moment, and Essie was aware that the others filled the staircase behind her. I merely strengthened the existing spell, Lilith said quietly. Bollocks, Essie spat. He forgot me completely, and he called the police on me. He thought I was a, like a burglar or a, a straight, someone who was going to hurt him. Horror slammed into her as she remembered what Josh had told her about his horrific ex, Maya, forcing himself on her in his sleep. No wonder he'd been so appalled. She just triggered a harrowing memory for him. Do you have any idea what you've done? She wept. 
He's a Hopkins, snapped Lilith. You shouldn't go anywhere near him anyway. What his family did to us hundreds of years ago, mother, get over it. It might be hundreds of years ago to you, said Lilith, but it was merely a week ago to me. And me, you stupid woman, I was there. I saw him. I bound him. The bounden be false, mumbled the voice from behind her. It was Maud's voice. Essie felt herself go still as terror spread through her body like concrete. What did you say? The bounden, tis false. Essie turned slowly and stared at the old woman. Him be bounden, not in ice, explained Maud, her gnarled fingers twisting together anxiously. I seen it. The ghost didn't be banished, and the monster swept away. Him did creep it through the door. Essie's gaze flew to her mother, and Lilith looked as horrified as she was. <clears throat> Hopkins followed them then, she said. Back here. Aye, said Maud. Why didn't you say something sooner? Maud shrugged. I give it thee the scarf, she said as if it was obvious. Oh my God, said Essie. Are you telling me the scarf scratched Josh? Because, ew, ew, are you telling me that Hopkins is, is in Josh? Ugh, said Blessing. And you two have been, ugh, Avery began, and Essie felt suddenly sick. It couldn't possibly be. Every time Josh had touched her, kissed her, every time that he had been with her, God damn it, that was Hopkins. Hot tears froze on her skin. No, him be a shadow pawn, is he, said Maud. Is he haunting Joshua, asked Lilith. The word be as good as any other. I thought you could feel Hopkins, accused Essie, turning to her mother. You said you always knew when he was there. I didn't know he was haunting your bloody boyfriend, Essie, Lilith said, and she looked shaken. Oh, maybe that's why you can't sense him. Yes, this book is by Kate Johnson. Well, maybe that's why you can't sense him, ventured Blessing. He's being, I don't know, masked by Josh. Essie swiped at her face. Was that why Josh had forgotten her now? Hopkins had taken over? But no, that couldn't be right. The man who'd left out of bed right now, raging and hating, filled with misogyny, he'd been Josh, frightened and appalled, but never violent. He knew exactly how to call the police too, which a 17th century ghost surely wouldn't know how to do. He'd been trying to protect Sienna and the baby. She could see it in his eyes. Oh my God, she said, as an even worse realization came over her. The baby. <clears throat> you think he's after the baby, said Blessing. Oh, then why didn't he try something when he was here? said Avery. There be powerful protections upon this house, said Prudence. Oh, and we would have noticed it, said Essie. I would have noticed it. There was a small diplomatic pause. What, uh, in all the time you spent fully dressed and discussing the topics of the day, then you would have noticed it, said Blessing. Essie felt her face burn. It's been all I could do to keep the floorboards from bursting into a leaf, Blessing muttered. We get it. You can have the big O now. Oh, my God, Essie muttered. Ah, yeah, you didn't have to be so vocal about it, said Avery. If we could kindly move on, said Lilith, and Essie looked at her mother with something like gratitude for what might have been the first time in her life. <clears throat> do you think Hopkins is actually going after the baby? Oh, it is logical, said Avery. Look at the facts. Same day Sienna arrived in Goodwinter was the same day Lilla told us that Hopkins was waking early. Which was also the same day that Josh first came here, Essie pointed out. Yeah, but only the Bellroom house. He'd been in the village a week or so already, right? <laughs> and the day that you did the ritual was the day she went into labor, Blessing added. And the following day, he followed us back through the door, and that was the day that the baby was born, agreed Essie. But why hasn't he come back today? It's been a week. Um, maybe because Sienna took the baby away from the house's protections, suggested Lilith. Mayhaps she named him, said Prudence. She said she hadn't decided on a name, Essie said. The book didn't seem to like that when I asked it. Essie felt, actually, very much felt every eye come to rest on her. What book? said Lilith. <clears throat> Chapter 18. 
The wind screamed in what seemed to be a constant howl, the thunder beneath it growling a bass note. Snow flew at the house from every direction, lighting up terrifying shades as lightning flashed and crackled. Hopefully the newborn baby, excuse me, helpfully, the newborn baby in Sienna's arms joined the cacophony, which made it rather hard for Josh to hear the police on the phone, especially given the interference on the line. Um, no, I really don't know how she got into the house. He shouted, all the doors and windows were locked. Do you have a camera somewhere? Anywhere? No, we don't have security cameras, said Josh. He frowned at Sienna and tried to move away from the baby's fretful screams, but she followed him through the downstairs rooms. They're, they're coming to install them next week. He checked all the doors, including the ones to the cellar and the attic, and they were all securely locked. The windows were latched shut and the curtains were undisturbed. He found nothing broken or missing, but there had been an extra phone lying on his bedside and Josh wondered what kind of idiot home invader this was. Josh, Sienna began, outside the village, what seems to, it's no, so are you sure, gone? Y yes, Josh said grimly. I tried looking through her cell phone for any clues, but it's locked. Well, we, GP, Hold of Josh, where is she? Persisted Sienna. The kitchen door rattled as a blast of snow hit it. She's gone, he told her. We're safe. I'm sorry, officer. My sister's just anxious. She has a newborn baby. I'm sure you can understand that. Cool. We'll keep trying. I'm not anxious, snapped Sienna. I'm worried. Josh, listen to me because this is important. Excuse me a moment. He held the phone away from his ears. What? Sienna, look, I know you're scared, but I'm scared. Yeah, that's a better word. I'm scared of you right now. He blinked at her. Nobody had ever been scared of Josh in his life. Your girlfriend's missing, Sienna said slowly and deliberately, and you don't really seem to care about that. What? He went cold at the thought of Maya could have found him. I don't have a... Whatever you two are calling yourselves, you can't spend the week in bed with her and then literally... You can't even look at anyone else? Oh my God, she's gone mad. Maybe this was some kind of postnatal psychosis. And now you're telling me there was a strange woman in your bed. Josh, don't interrupt me. She was here last night and she's gone now. No one was here except for you and me and the baby. His heart was still pounding at the idea that anything could have happened to the baby, even if its screams were currently making it impossible for him to think. She was here. We ate Chinese food. Don't you remember? She had never heard of General Sal's chicken and she ate the whole bag of those prawn cracker thingies. Look. Sienna shifted the baby from one arm to the other and wretched open the fridge. There were piles of plastic cartons in there. Look, the, uh, the, the crispy quarter duck. I didn't order it. You didn't order it. They make the pancakes differently here, said Josh reluctantly moving. Right, you kept saying that. And then the wine glasses, look. He glanced over the sink where two wine glasses stood waiting to be washed. So? Sienna gestured madly at the baby. Um, hello, I'm not drinking, am I? Essie was here last night. She was. Her toothbrush is probably still in the bathroom. He shook his head. No, 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 no. That's not right. Nobody had been here but him and Sienna. She must have been drinking juice or something from a wine glass. He ordered some new food for a change. How is he supposed to remember every detail with babies screaming like that in his mind? So, Josh glanced at the phone in his hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. My sister's making up some weird shit right now. I'm not making up anything right now. I'm going to go upstairs and look in your bathroom right now. Josh sprinted after her. Sienna deliberately blocked him from getting past her and stood in the doorway of the bathroom and said, look, two toothbrushes. Josh stared at them. The bathroom was only half finished and he'd been using a coffee mug to keep his toothbrush and toothpaste in. And now there was another toothbrush beside it. And... Sienna said, marching over to the bin. Given the noise you two were making last night, yeah, if there was no one else here last night, please tell me why there's a wrapper in the trash can. The bathroom window rattled, lighting up with snow. <clears throat> Sir, did you say that someone was there with you last night? Asked the voice on the phone, and Josh began to wonder what was going on because he felt mad. No, no, there can't. I am not looking for the used one. You can get the goddamn forensics here if you want to. Sienna looked furious. He'd woken her up to tell her that the police were on their way because of an intruder, and now she was telling him, but wait a second, that couldn't be right. How could he not know that he had brought a woman home? Was this some kind of prank? Had she gotten a friend to pretend to do all of this? But Sienna didn't have any friends in this country unless she'd been lying about that, but why would she lie about that? I don't know, Josh said bleakly into the phone. I, I actually don't know what's happening. break. <clears throat> there, said Essie, storming into the library and pointing an accusing finger at the book on the stand. It was large and old, and the pages were yellowed at the edges, and it was open towards the end. 
Well, see, you guys, Sienna's not related, right? Because Sienna's his half-sister. And, oh wait, but they do have the same dad. So I guess she is related. So I'm wrong about that. Oh. Well, then I don't know. Weird. The others crowded in behind her and Lilitha said, I've never seen that book before in my life. That's because you're never bloody here, as he snapped and strode over and glared at the pages. Here, look, Edward Mason Hopkins, by his first wife, a son, Joshua, by his second wife, a daughter, Sienna, to Sienna, a son, <gasps> Matthew Edwards Hopkins. Her voice trailed to nothing halfway through the name. The words seemed to glow on the page and Essie thought she could smell something burning. What did you say? whispered her mother, sweeping up beside her. Uh-oh, she called the baby Matthew, said Blessing behind her. Essie stared hard at the page as if she would will the words to change, but there they were, written in faded ink as if they had always been there. Matthew Edward Hopkins, born 29th of October, 2022, father unknown. Tis the monster, gasped Maud. There was a sudden fury of movement as she slipped onto the ground and the others rushed to help her. Maud, did you see this coming? Blessing eased her back against the bookshelf and Avery found a cushion for her. Maud's milky eyes flickered. The monster in over and over in the yard. The monster in so many. Her fingers moved as if she was feeling a pattern in the wool that wasn't even there. And as he realized that something had made her shiver, for the first time that she could ever remember, Maud wasn't knitting. Maud, she said, kneeling beside the oldest member of the coven, where's your knitting? Her fingers moved helplessly. Tis ended, she whispered. The witches looked at each other in horror. Prudence, go and fetch it, Essie said. What did Maud mean that it had ended? The knitting or the, the future? Maud knitted the future. None of them knew if that meant that she saw it or created it. Essie wasn't even sure if Maud herself knew. Ah, uh, you mean every piece you were knitting is ended? Avery said as if trying to convince themselves. All of it, said Maud. Her breathing seemed shallow. The future has stopped. The words reached inside Essie and twisted her stomach. She glanced at the others. Even her mother looked horrified. There be no knitting, said Prudence, flying back through the door. There be a pot of needles all neat and a basket of yarn, but the knitting, there be not any. Maud had been there as long as Essie could remember, as long as any of them could remember, and she was old for sure, but she couldn't be dying. She couldn't be dying, could she? The old woman slumped back against the pillow, supported on either side by Blessing and Avery, and Blessing had her fingers on Maud's wrist, as he had never seen her look so worried. Go, go and bring us something, she commanded, and there were tears in her eyes. Some needles, some yawn, quick, Prudence. I don't, Prudence began, and Lilith snapped at her. Quickly, child. Child, Essie muttered when Prudence had gone. Mother, she's 300 years older than you. She's technically younger than you, said Lilith. Technicality, said Essie. Maud, open your eyes. Will you please open your eyes? Maud sighed. It's a bit, she said, her eyes still closed. I cannot tell ye what will come, only what may. Fate intertwined did not I tell ye. Essie groaned. And you said there would be a door, a time door. What else had Maud told her? That there would be a man or, or maybe a woman? Oh. You mean me, said Avery. No, 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 I think she meant Josh or Sienna. She made a baby hat in burnt Sienna, didn't you? Wait, that doesn't mean there's gonna be a fire. Does that mean there's gonna be a fire? The world be warming, murmured Maud, her eyes still closed. Like, like global warming? The ritual, child, twas done too early. Essie shot her mother a look. "'Tis the day today must be done or all days will stop.'" Maud's hand suddenly gripped Essie's. "'In fire it began, as a bet. In fire it must end. The son of Hob!' her voice trailed off. "'Do you mean Josh?' A tiny shake of Maud's head. Prudence appeared again, and this time a ball of yarn and some needles were in her hand, but Maud paid them no attention. Essie's gut clenched. "'Please, Maud, can you please knit what you mean?' Maud said nothing for a moment, but her hand squeezed Essie's. What burned must be burned. There twas done. Tis he must always. Then her hands went slack. Maud, no, 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 Maud, not today. She could not lose Maud and Josh in the same day. No. There's, there's still a pulse, said Blessing, and Essie exhaled hard. Ah, we should get her to bed. 
we should get her to the hospital in this weather, said Blessing, gesturing to the tall library window where snow was still battering at the panes. No one's going anywhere in this. It's not me. I mean, this, the snow might be me, as he conceded, but I can't really help it right now. And the snow was already here. Avery and Blessing were picking up Maud, and she seemed to weigh very little. As he held the door open for them, helpless to do anything more, Blessing had medical training, and Avery was really skilled at making the right drink or food to make a person feel better, but she didn't know what food or drink could help Maud right now. She turned back to the library, or maybe a book could help her. Her eyes phase on her, her gaze fell on her mother Lilith, so beautiful in her elegant nightdress with her hair glossy and curls over one shoulder. She looked like she belonged in a classy old horror movie tempting Dracula, although she was the sort of woman who stalked the old bastard in the end, and her hair would still be perfect after that. Yeah, apparently we do have a thing for Snow Queen, that's true. Essie shoved a hand through her bedraggled curls and tried to clean her glasses on her t-shirt, but it was soaked through. Her feet, now she was no longer running on adrenaline, stung and ached all over from the cuts. She felt like a drowned rat, and she probably looked even worse. Josh wouldn't care, she told herself, and her heart was a little more broken than before. What do you think Maud meant by all that fire business? said Lilith. Essie wanted to shout at her. She wanted to scream that this was all Lilith's fault and that she had lost Josh. And maybe that was true, but it wouldn't actually help right now. Her shoulders slumped and she made it to the nearest sofa before she collapsed. I don't know, she said. I do ice and snow, remember? I don't do fire. Well, then light one over there, said Lilith, gesturing at the fireplace. Essie glared at her. That's not the same and you know it. Do I, as a bet? Her mother came to sit beside her. I might have not gone to university like you, but I do know that ice and fire are opposites. One is the absence of the other. That's not really how physics even works. Who mentioned any physics? We're witches. And besides, if fire is all that's needed, any fool with a tinderbox can make that and then control it. Fire isn't like ice, mother. It doesn't melt away. It spreads. It feeds. That house back in the 17th century, it was made of wood, lined with wood and fire in every room. Madness. Yes, no wonder it burned down, said Lilith, and Essie felt her, come, her head come up all by itself, and she stared at her mother. Brook Manor burned down, she said slowly, in the late 17th century. She couldn't remember when, a hundred years or so after the good Queen Bess had visited with all the people. Yes, and then the family moved to the home farm, said Lilith. A home farm, which was now called Brook Manor Farm. And even the thought of Josh's house made Essie want to cry. She bit back the sobs. The family, she said slowly, which was Mistress Agatha and her ward. Hopkins' son, said Lilith. Their gazes met. What burnt must burn, said Essie, but the boy must have survived the fire because he did have children, Josh's ancestors. At the same time, they leapt to their feet and they rushed over to the book open on the stand. Essie heaved the pages back and flipped through the ancient parchment without any care for it. There, John Hopkins, born 1644, mother unknown. By his, by his wife, Dorothy, he had a daughter, Constance, born 1669. A son, Geoffrey, born 1671. A son, a daughter, there was a smudge on the page and as he skimmed past it to read, died 1680 in a house fire. For a moment, mother and daughter both paused, gazing at the old ink on the page. Matthew Hopkins' son, had died in a house fire, the same fire that burnt down Brook Manor where he had been raised by Mistress Agatha. It fire, it began, in fire it must end, the son of Hob, the monster, murmured Lilith. The monster you never told me about, Essie reminded her bloody winter ritual. You let me think it was all about snow and white Christmases and freaking winter wonderlands. Lilith shook her head. Life's not a Bing Crosby movie, my dear. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to frighten you. You were so good at the ritual, it didn't seem necessary to tell you. And if I got bored with winter and just decided to let it drizzle a bit one year and the monster had suddenly awoken, Lilith sighed. I'm sorry, Essie. I was just trying to protect you. You? Essie snorted. Yes, me. I know I'm not terribly good at it, but I am your mother. Lilith's hand touched hers very briefly. I wanted to protect my little girl from that monster. 
as he blinked back unexpected tears. Ignorance isn't protection, mother. This time Lilith's sigh was gusty. Well, I know that now, she said. Well, here we are then. Hopkins is a monster and now you know. I thought we'd bound him safely. I, I, I truly don't know how he's come back. You think he lived on through his son? Did that mean that Josh had inherited some of Matthew's evil? No, he couldn't have. No, not Josh. Lilith shook, his, Lilith shook her head. I think you bound him in ice that first time, unless Alice Godwin continued the ritual and he's been frozen ever since until a child with his name born right here in this house where he was so bound. So why the fire then? Lilith shrugged. Sometimes fire is just fire, as a pet. Essie dealt her a look. Ice and fire and binding monsters all over the place where it began and a fire is just a fire? Give me a fucking break. Lilith laughed, which wasn't something Essie had ever seen before. All right, she said. What do you think happened then? Essie spread her hands. I don't know, but it cannot possibly be a coincidence. Look, what's this under the smudge here? They both peered at it. Oh, we could use Avery for this, Essie muttered. Or a handkerchief, Lilith said. She produced one from the recesses of her negligee and spat on it and dabbed gently at the page. It's just dirt. It's probably blood, said Essie and frowned down as the memory came back to her. That parchment that Josh had found in the witch ball, the one that had broken the perception spell filter for him, it had worked because he accidentally got blood on it and she had a photo of it on her phone, which of course was at Josh's house, damn it. But if she could somehow get him to read it, then maybe, I don't know, hope swelled but burst suddenly when she remembered the look on his face when he told her to get out of the house. No, he wouldn't let her near him. It's the name of John's children, said Lilith, and look at the last one. Essie knew what it would be before she even looked at it. Matthew, born shortly before the fire. Hopkins came back for his freaking namesake and burnt the whole place down. Or maybe not, Essie tapped a finger on the page. John Hopkins was being raised by Mick, Mistress Agatha. You met her. Yes, indeed. She was a good friend of mine. She despised Hopkins. Yes, she very much did. Maybe she burnt the place down. Lilith was silent a moment. She would have been very old by then. Yeah, but we both know there's witch blood in that family. Lilith gave her a sharp look. Why, you felt it? As he shrugged, internally feeling somewhat smug. I figured a few things out while I was there, like Hopkins seeing ghosts for one thing and his absolute hatred of witches for another. And then there was Josh, so many generations later, able to read a spell without knowing it was a spell, who healed minor wounds in a matter of minutes. She squeezed her eyes shut. She would fix things with Josh. She definitely would. But first, she had to stop the world from ending. Damn. crazy. There's a lot going on. It's hard to keep up. It was a little crazy. It's a little crazy pants. So much happened. It's wild. It's wild. Um, well, yes, brain malfunctions. Um, we will probably be done with this book by Thursday. I know, right? It's really hard. Yeah. That's why it's, it's good that it's recorded. So we can always go back and listen to it later. Um, but there's a lot going on. Uh, very interesting. I'm very curious to see how this all shakes out. Do not know. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, just so you all know, I did check on our um, it is totally unpredictable. I did check on our library book for the Once and Future Witches, and it looks like it's going to be a couple more weeks before that one becomes available. So I figured we would start Hex in the City, which is the next book in this series first. And then by the time we finish that, Once and Future Witches should be available, which is good. So that's where we're at with that. And, um... Yeah, and then we'll read Once in Future Witches, which I'm still super excited about. 
I was really hoping that we would be reading that around election time, but we'll see. I don't know. Because it's about, you know, suffragettes, um, which feels poignant in a lot of ways. But anyway, I am going to go pack a bunch of orders and take them to the post office. And I will see you all later. And um, that's it. That's the whole kit and caboodle. So have a great day until then.